Good afternoon, everyone. And as we wait for more people to log on today, I wanted to thank you for joining us to celebrate Women's History Month. I'm Rachel Rosen, the Communications Director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our staff, our president, Mark Melman, and our board and our board co-chairs, Todd Richman and Ann Lewis, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are well and are enjoying the spring. For those getting ready to celebrate Passover or Easter, we hope you have a meaningful holiday as well. In just a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to DMFI board co-chair Ann Lewis, but first I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. If you like what you're hearing today, please consider following us on social media. We're on Twitter and we're on Facebook and Instagram. You can sign up for our news and updates at dmfi.org. And if you wanna ask a question and you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit it through the Zoom interface. And if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the comment section. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to DMFI board co-chair Ann Lewis to introduce our first distinguished guest. Ann? Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on wherever you are. Thank you all for joining us for Women's History Month. It is my honor to welcome Senator Jean Shaheen, who is the first woman ever, I want to talk about history makers, the first woman to be elected as both a governor and a United States Senator. And that happened when she got elected to represent New Hampshire in the Senate, where she's been ever since in 2008. Bef between being governor and getting elected to the Senate, Senator Shaheen was director of Harvard University's Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. Among her many policy achievements, Senator Shaheen has won resources for his state's fight against the opioid epidemic, worked to expand healthcare access, and fought to protect women's rights at home and around the world. Senator Shaheen serves on five different Senate committees, including the Foreign Relations Committee, where she is the only woman member. I just have to say that once more, because women around the world are counting on Senator Shaheen. And it is my understanding there are a lot of them, like maybe half the population. She is the only woman member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Shaheen is a longstanding, valuable friend of the US-Israel relationship. We're just thrilled to have her with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne, for that really nice introduction. And I should tell everyone that Anne is one of the first women I met when I got in politics. Of course, she was at the national stage and I was working in New Hampshire, but she was such a great role model. So thank you, Anne, for everything that you've done over the years. And it's so nice to join with all of you to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is how do we get more women involved in politics? And as I think about, you know, I have this theory that some people are born with musical ability and some of us can um, draw and some of us get the political gene. So I'm convinced that I was born with the political gene because I was always interested in politics. And I can remember being a college student in the 60s and there were only two women on the world stage. One was Indira Gandhi, who of course led India for a number of years and the other was Golda Meir from um, Israel. So as I um, thought about the future, it meant a lot to have world leaders who we could look to. And clearly that's one of the challenges as we think about how do we get more women involved in politics and government is to make sure that we have um, women role models that they can point to and see right now in the Congress, about 27% of women in the Congress, or 27% of members in the Congress are women. Um, as Anne pointed out, we're half of the world. And if we continue to elect women at the rate we have been, we've gotten a little better in recent years, but it will take us another 100 years to reach parity in Congress. That is too long. Um, and the reason it makes a difference is because we know that as women, we bring to our roles, whatever we do, um, the experiences that we've had as women, and they're different than men's. And it's important to have women at the table, whether it's at a boardroom or um, in Congress or at, um, you know, at a social service organization. It makes a difference. And we know that when legislators, legislatures have more women in them, they tend to have more women and family-friendly policies. 
So it makes a difference. And, and that's true whether they're Democrats or Republicans. So there, it does make a difference when we elect women and women are at the table. And um, so I'm hopeful that part of your work today is to get some young people excited about how they can get involved in uh, government and politics. And I know you're gonna hear from Tippi Livni a little later, who has been a wonderful role model in Israel. I had a chance to meet former foreign minister Livni um, on one of my trips to Israel. And as you all know, she is very impressive. So I'm sure that um, you will enjoy hearing from her as well as the other um, presenters you're gonna hear from today. So I'm gonna stop there because as um, some of you as may know, I'm actually in the Senate today and we are in the middle of some votes that are very important that have to do with ensuring that we can extend something called the Paycheck Protection Program to help small businesses. It's one of, one of my bills. And so we've got some votes. I may be called away to go vote. So I'm gonna stop with that and see if I can get to some of the questions that you all may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. I wanted to remind those listening and joining us today, please submit questions in the Q&A feature if you're on Zoom or you can type them into Facebook and we'll try to, to get to many of them. Senator, th thanks so much. You were, you were the first woman in US history to be elected both governor and Senator. Can you talk, talk to us You know what, bit? Rachel, I'm just yeah. gonna interrupt you for a minute. Sure. They're calling uh -huh. me to vote. I will go vote and come right sure. back down. Okay. We'll have some time in between. So if Perfect. that works and that way you can do some of your housekeeping and um, get collect some questions. Very good. Thank you so much, Senator. So in the interim, Mark, I, I think I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to talk to us about uh, some recent DMFI events and maybe a little bit uh, about the Israeli elections. Sure. Um, well, let me just, uh, and I'm vamping here, as everybody uh, understands, uh, votes in the Senate happen. That's just the way of the world. Um, and senators have to vote. That's their job. Uh, so we appreciate Senator Shaheen uh, joining us and, and coming back uh, to us as well. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, we've just had a, an election in Israel. As you also know, the election is only part of the process uh, of, of governing in Israel. Um, we do not yet have the full results from the election. There are several hundred thousand ballots uh, yet to be counted. They probably will not be fully counted until Friday. So we're not exactly sure what all the results are uh, at the moment. But once those results are posted, we have a pretty good sense that it is gonna be very difficult as it has been for the last, uh, well, let's say four elections. Uh, for uh, uh, anybody to form a government uh, without somebody breaking a promise somewhere along the line. Uh, the reason the last government was formed was because uh, Benny Gantz uh, decided to break a promise that he had made not to join a government with Netanyahu. Uh, he did uh, join that government um, and that's what made it possible to, to make a government. There was uh, tensions, tremendous tensions uh, within that government. That's why it fell apart. But the reality is uh, there are, we are now sort of locked into a situation or Israelis are locked into a situation where both or all the parties have taken positions that are incommensurate with making a government uh, given uh, the, the, what appears to be the, uh, uh, the, the election results. Uh, as you all know, uh, to make a government uh, in a parliamentary system, you need a majority. That means you need a coalition of about 61, not about, at least 61 members of the Knesset to be able to, uh, to form that government. Um, there are, we don't know the exact numbers, as I say, but roughly 58, 59 uh, on the anti-Netanyahu side block, if you will, the people that have said they will not sit with Netanyahu. There are about 58, 59 on the pro-Netanyahu side, the people who said, well, they will or might uh, sit with uh, Netanyahu uh, in a government. So this is the basic uh, division in the country right now is between those who is not between so much right and left as it is between people who believe that Netanyahu should con continue as prime minister uh, and those who believe he should not. Uh, and those who believe he should uh, argue that he's obviously done, a, uh, from their point of view, done a good job uh, dealing with the multiple issues that Israel faces. Uh, and they reject the, uh, the accusations against him that will be heard in court in the coming months. Uh, people on the other side uh, some of them think he's done a terrible job. Some of them think he's done a good job, but they all believe that it is inappropriate uh, from a moral point of view, or at least from a practical point of view for a prime minister 
to be facing a, a criminal trial and have to be in court and so on. So this is the basic division <clears throat> that exists in the country. Uh, and there is not a, at this moment, there does not appear to be a majority <clears throat> for either side. Um, but the next piece of business here uh, is the most important uh, piece, which is to say these parties will all negotiate with each other to figure out how they, whether and how someone can form a government with 61 uh, Knesset votes. Uh, there will be a lot of behind the scenes discussions. Uh, there are now already a lot of behind the scenes discussions among the party leaders. Uh, the, the next formal step in the process uh, at the end of the month uh, the, the election results are officially certified. President Rivlin has said that at that point, uh, he will then begin the process of consultations, which means he will meet with each, with each party leader who is going to be represented in the Knesset uh, and ask that party leader who they recommend to be prime minister. Uh, and that recommendation then carries significant weight because the president is then supposed to task with forming a government, the person that he believes is most likely to be able to form a government with 61 uh, supporters, and that that uh, uh, that uh, person uh, will be uh, would be given the first chance to form a government uh, again based on those recommendations. So that process of consultation will not begin at least until the end of this month, uh, after Passover and after uh, the election results are certified. Uh, so that's the beginning of that process. He will have a period where he'll be meeting with those. Uh, uh, party leaders, they'll be giving him the, him their opinions, and he will make a determination as to who he will give the first opportunity for uh, to to form uh, to to form a government. Um, at that point, whichever individual he uh, uh, tasks uh, to form a government will have 28 days um, the uh, to to do so. Uh, the president, uh, President Rivlin, is then in position to offer a 14-day extension if that person can't form a government. Uh, in, uh, in 28 days. Uh, if after 28 and 14, uh, still no government, uh, the president then has the opportunity to, to uh, task another individual uh, with trying to form a government and they will have another 28 days in which to form a government. It is impossible, it is possible, I should say, it is possible that we will just be headed back to, or Israel will be headed back to elections again as they have been now uh, uh, several times this year because of the inability uh, to form a government. Uh, this last government was a, sort of a cry for help. People saying we have, we can't just keep having elections. We need to have a government. Um, whether or not, and the pressure on this election was very strong in a similar direction. What, how that will net out in the end, uh, we just don't know yet. So it, the main thing to keep in mind though, is that it is a, a very uh, uh, close election uh, in the sense that matters. And second, it will be a very long time, likely be a very long time before we know exactly uh, what's, going to, uh, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Um, Rachel, were you going to? Yep, I, I have a question for you from, from one of our, our uh, listeners today about, about the Israeli election and the Kahanist party and, and what you think that all means. Sure, look, this is a serious problem. Uh, there's the joining together uh, of a Kahanist party with uh, basically an anti-LGBTQ party. Uh, they got uh, uh, small parties. Israel is a proportional representation system. If you get 3.25%, again, let me repeat that, three and a quarter percent of the vote, uh, you get into the Knesset with four seats. Um, exactly how many seats this party, it's a small party, exactly how many seats it's gonna have, we don't know yet, but it will be clearly represented in the Knesset, uh, probably have uh, five or potentially six or seven seats, we don't know yet. Um, but in any event, uh, this party will be represented in the Knesset. Um, DMFI has made a statement as of some other organizations uh, saying that they really should not be part of a government. Um, that's our opinion. The reality is this is a, a, a the Kahanist part of this party is officially uh, designated as a terrorist group by the United States government and has been for many years. Uh, so that will complicate things uh, if, if they are, it complicates things, putting, having them in the Knesset in the first place and uh, putting them in the government uh, would complicate things even more uh, for obvious reasons. Again, DMFI has taken a position uh, against uh, this party uh, being in the government as we earlier took a position suggesting they shouldn't be in the Knesset. But uh, obviously our ability to influence Israeli voters is somewhat limited.
Great. And Mark, when do you think we'll have some more clarity about how uh, the Israeli elections will sort of shake out? Well, as I try to suggest, I think it's going to be a while. Uh, we won't have the final results, even the final vote count, uh, until Friday, uh, tomorrow. Um, and then everyone will immediately be taking off for, for Passover. Um, so uh, uh, we're not going to, we'll, we'll know something more uh, tomorrow. Um, but as I said, these consultations with the parties won't begin until the end of the month. And we, I don't think we'll have a very clear sense uh, of how things are proceeding, at least until uh, the middle of next month and possibly much later than that. Great. Now I thought, uh, Mark, we might want to show our- I think Senator Shaheen is back. Oh, fantastic. I am, sure. thanks. Hi, Senator Shaheen, thanks. That was uh, so quick and thank you for <laughs> coming back so quickly and joining us. Tell and us- Mark filled in, I'm sure, very well. <laughs> yes, yes, we had a robust conversation about the Israeli elections. Uh, Senator Sheen, you talked a lot about encouraging more young women to get involved in politics. Could you talk to us about how you think uh, we might be able to, to achieve that? You know, um, Anne said that between being governor and senator, I spent some time at the Kennedy School of Government. And one of the things that used to always distress me was that I would have a room full of undergraduates and when I would say to them, how many of you would like to run for office someday? Almost every male hand in the room would go up. But if we got a third of the young women, that was a good number. So I think we have seen those numbers increase, um, certainly after Donald Trump's election in um, the 2018 elections, we saw many more women interested in running for office at all levels, which has been very encouraging. And I think one of the best ways to encourage young women is for them to see other women in office and to know that it's doable. Um, and, you know, like anything else, it's a challenge, but it, it's something that if you have an interest, there is support out there. There are groups on both sides of the aisle that can help with raising money that it may take. There are um, lots of people who are interested in helping. One of the things I always say to people who are thinking about running for office is think about where you want to live and what you want to do. And that's the best way to get involved. My experience has been that for most women, at least in my generation, that what got us involved in running for office was usually a cause, caring about something that you wanted to try and change or make a difference on. It wasn't the idea of running for office itself. So I think if people, if people go to their communities, they think about what they wanna get involved in, that's one of the best ways to, to get involved as you think about running for office. And, and I always ask people to get involved on campaigns. If you have somebody you wanna work for, think about what you can do. And campaigns are usually pretty, based pretty much on merit. If you do well, you move up. Senator, I have a question from Lisa Eisen that I wanted to ask you as well. And, and Lisa writes, I totally agree that we need more women in power and that will result in more women in family-friendly policies. You mentioned women in legislatures vote for more women in family-friendly policies, whether they're Democratic or Republican women. But most Republican women today are not pro-choice. Many are not supportive of policies that advance gender equality and reproductive equality. We're supporting low-income families and people of color. Can you please elaborate on how you see the bipartisan divide and where you see there are common areas to advance them together? Yeah, it's been really disappointing to me. When I first got involved in politics, um, some of my mentors were pro-choice Republican women who were interested in seeing all women get involved in politics. And it's really been disappointing to see the Republican Party take such a hard right turn, um, not just on issues of re reproductive rights, but on family planning as well. Um, you're, you're, I'm sure you're all aware that during the Trump administration, they expanded the global gag rule, which would limit um, US funding going to any organizations that perform abortion internationally um, to include any, basically any healthcare organizations. And it's had a huge impact on so many of those 
NGOs that have done such good work for women over the years. So um, again, it's been very disappointing to see that happen. Now, I have tried to look for ways that I can partner with some of my Republican colleagues on issues that may not be obvious in, in thinking about women working on them. I'm on the Armed Services Committee as well, and we have a record number of women on the Armed Services Committee. And so looking at, at ways in which we can work together there to support um, our military families, to support the spouses of men serving in the military. Those have been a couple of areas that have been important to work on. And while it doesn't address some of the other issues that I care a lot about, I think it is a way to begin to build those relationships, which can lead to working on other things together. Um, right now, I talked about the vote that I'm, we have underway. My co-sponsor on this legislation is Ben Cardin, who I'm sure you know from Maryland, but it's also Susan Collins from Maine. And so um, one of the things I hope will happen is that we will see the Republican Party moderate somewhat, recognize that the trajectory that um, we're seeing where they are ex in some cases excluding um, the voices of women and people of color is not a winning strategy long term. And so they, they will begin to think about whether that's the best way to proceed. Senator, thank you so much. I have one more question, and I, then I know uh, you need to, to, to move on, and we're so grateful to have you here. It, it's a question from Mark Gerstein. He's a board member uh, with us at DMFI, and he asks a foreign policy question. How do you think the U.S. government and Congress can further support the peace efforts around the Abraham Accords? I know that Mark gave an update on what was happening in Israel and and what the new government might look like. I'm sorry that I missed that because Mark, I bet your insights are better than mine at this point. Um, but I think obviously the United States is gonna support Israel and thinking about how we can um, do that in a way that helps look at um, achieving a broader peace across the Middle East, I think is going to be important. There were, there was some progress made during the Trump administration, I think having um, some other Arab countries make peace with Israel was really important. And I think that's helpful as we think long-term about how do we address um, the continuing um, challenges that um, Israel has um, with the Palestinians. I, I continue to believe that a two-state solution is the best answer and that um, whatever we can do in the United States to support that is important. Thank you. Senator Shaheen, thank you for your extraordinary leadership. Thank you for being an inspiration to so many women around the country and, and around the world today. Well, thank you all so much for um, giving me this opportunity and for all of the great work that you're doing, um, not just to support women, but to support Israel and to support supporting um, a sustained peace in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. Now I'm very pleased to turn it over to our board member, State Representative Alma Hernandez, uh, to introduce our next distinguished guest. It's so nice to see you, Alma. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's great to be with you all. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to be able to introduce a very amazing woman leader. Um, and I believe she's on now, right? She's on, okay, perfect. Just making sure. So I'm, I'm thrilled to, I'm really thrilled to introduce uh, former Vice Prime Minister and Israeli Foreign Minister Zipi Livni, a trailblazing leader in his Israeli politics. Um, Minister Livni has, was first elected to the Knesset in 1999 and has since held many different high level positions in Israeli government, including Minister of Foreign Affairs and served as the first female Minister of Justice, uh, first female Vice 
Prime Minister and the first female leader of the opposition. She served as the leader of the Israeli political party Kadima and later founded and led the Hatnua party. Uh, Minister Livni also served as the chief negotiator in the last two rounds of negotiations between Israel and Palestinians. And she has championed the vision of two states for two peoples. As a member of the Israeli National Security Cabinet, she helped forge Security Council resolutions that led to the end of the Second Lebanon War. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome Minister Zibi Livni, um, who is here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Yes, now I'm unmuted. Hello, thank you. Minister Olivier, it's so nice to, to have you here. Did you want to start with some opening remarks? And if not, we could go right into the Q&A. No, let's go to questions. All right, I great. Answer the things which are of your interest, in, interest instead of giving my speech. Excellent. Well, we love, I think we're all very uh, interested in hearing your general reactions uh, to this week's Israeli elections. Well, Basically, we just uh, got the results, it's a tie in Israel. Uh, nobody knows what will happen. I do hope that we will have a change and uh, we'll have a government that represent what I believe are the Israeli uh, values and the right vision for the state of Israel, which is more liberal, uh, more uh, pro-peace based on two states for two peoples. I'm not sure that we can have this kind of government, but at least we can have a change in the direction, a change in our national GPS, hopefully. Great. I wanted to remind our, our folks listening to please submit questions uh, for Minister Livni through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, you can type it into, into the comments uh, as well. At Minister Livni, you've led the opposition and held seven ministries but you didn't start at the top. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in politics and what were the, some of the challenges that you encountered? Well, I heard what Senator Shaheen said uh, toward the end that she was speaking about the need to join politics because you have a vision, because you want to do something, not just to take a job or to run for office. There's a reason to it. And my reason, uh, my internal, I was driven by the need to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinians. So uh, it was Yom Kippur in 1995, just a few weeks before the assassination of Prime Minister Rabin. And I looked at my children, they were at the time five and eight. And I said, okay, I, I'm a lawyer by profession. I practice law and say, okay, what am I living them in terms of what kind of state I'm living them? And uh, the state of Israel, the country was divided between two different camps. One was the camp of the land of Israel, speaking about the rights of the Jewish people on the, entire, on the entire land. And on the other side, there was the camp that called itself the camp of peace. And nobody listened. And I felt that I'm caught in between, like, okay, I believe in the rights of the Jewish people on the entire land, but in order to keep the values of the state of Israel. As a Jewish democratic state, we need to divide the land and to find a solution based on the national aspiration of the Jews to a state of their own and also of the Palestinians. So I decided to join politics driven by this uh, vision, which is still my vision, even though I didn't achieve peace, but I do believe that it is an Israeli interest. Just a little bit about some, if any, challenges you feel that you faced being a woman in Israeli politics? Uh, yes, because um, we live in a world of images and perception and perceptions and Israel is always in the midst of uh, security problems, uh, terror attacks, and in this world of images, you know, women can speak about peace, but they cannot take care of security, which is completely nonsense but yet uh, people uh, undermine uh, or cannot uh, embrace the idea that we are better in, in uh, making decisions even on security. So what I learned uh, during, um, while sitting in the Israeli cabinet is that 
we have uh, a broader view about security needs and security is more than just uh, military approach. Uh, it's taking in consideration uh, broader aspects. So this is what I learned, but as you heard in the United States, the question of uh, who's gonna um, uh, take the phone call 3 a.m. was not, uh, uh, was asked in English, I think that when Hillary Clinton ran for office as I was asked in Hebrew. I mean, it's okay for them that a woman would take the phone and say, hello, I'm giving you the prime minister. But the idea of uh, a woman taking care of these security challenges is something that it took some time to the public opinion to accept it. And when I ran for office, it was more obvious, but it took some time to reach this moment. Minister, uh, we have a question from Adam Ahrens about the Abraham Accords that I'd love for you to weigh in on. And do you believe the Abraham Accords and the new alliances will lead Palestinians back to the negotiation table? And would a change in prime ministers do that as well? Well, I am completely supportive of Abraham Accords. Uh, it's a huge change in the region. It, it is really a new Middle East. Uh, but when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, I think that in a way, uh, this conflict was abandoned and it would be more difficult for Israeli leaders to make the decisions that need to be made because it's not only about the agreements with the Arab world, it's about an Israeli prime minister speaking about that now everything which is needed is peace for peace. Now, peace for peace works when you don't have real conflicts with these Gulf states or uh, Morocco, but it wouldn't work with the Palestinians. And when we negotiate with the Palestinians, we need to understand that there are compromises that need to be made. Now, unfortunately, in the past, the idea was that when we achieve peace with the Palestinians, there is nothing real that Israel can gain. We are giving uh, part of the land, we are taking uh, security calculated risks, maybe we'll get terror in return as uh, what happened in Gaza Strip. So the whole idea was that the fruits of peace can, cam can come from Gulf states and Arab states, because uh, in accordance to the Arab Peace Initiative, the idea was that normalization would come with uh, and conditional to peace with the Palestinians. So as an Israeli, uh, I'm truly happy to uh, have normalization with the Arab world. And frankly, I had discrete meetings with most of these leaders when I was foreign minister, but um, I'm afraid that uh, we, we are going to see stalemate and stagnation on um, on peace negotiations in the near future. I am glad that uh, the new uh, Biden administration said clearly that the goal is two states for two peoples. And I believe as an Israeli, that it is an Israeli interest, but I don't think that we can expect real drama or uh, invitation of an Israeli leader and a Palestinian leader to a new Camp David uh, to come David to, to reach uh, an agreement, but it is not less important to keep the door open. When we know that instead of, uh, that our national GPS and also the GPS of the administration is not greater Israel and annexation, but it is about keeping Israel as a Jewish democratic state and stopping uh, in the way in, in the peace station and uh, trying to achieve peace with the Palestinians, I think that when this is the message, it's clear in Israel that annexation is not on the table, and this is a very good news, and that um, we should keep the road open. Less settlement activities, uh, more easing the life of the Palestinians, and hopefully in the future negotiations uh, for final status agreement. Thank you, and, and you've touched, you've now touched on this next question a bit, but I still, hoped you could maybe talk a little bit more about um, the obstacles to making peace. And Ada Razin 
asks, what are those obstacles? Could you expand on that a bit? Um, I negotiated twice. I uh, was the chief negotiator on uh, the Israeli side twice in 2008 in the Annapolis process, the Bush administration, and in the last round of negotiations uh, in the Obama administration. And at first it feels, you know, it's like two magnets that at first it goes smooth and we can uh, uh, find a way to finalize so to, to bridge the gaps in some of uh, uh, the final status uh, issues. But then toward the end, it looks that the gaps are narrow, but it's very deep because it is connected to very sensitive, sensitive symbolic issues on both sides. Uh, and therefore, I think that it is more obvious today, uh, or, or basically if you would ask even the average Israeli and even those that voter, voted for right-wing um, parties in Israel in the last round of elections, what are the terms of the, an agreement that they would support? Mostly would, you would hear something which is very close to the Clinton parameters. But in the end, uh, there's a need for both sides. And I, I, I can say, you know, as a leader of the leader of the opposition in Israel, I criticized my own government for not making the right decisions, but I can, unfortunately, I can criticize also the other side because in 2014, uh, we reached an understanding with the, the Obama administration to have um, a kind of an American paper framework for negotiations and Netanyahu was willing to negotiate on the basis of 67 lines, something which is very close to the Clinton parameters with reservations because he wanted to have deniability, he wanted to get the opportunity to say to Israelis, well, it's not me, it's the Americans. But yet, unfortunately, Abu Mazen didn't give an answer to the administration. So I, I don't think that right now peace is just around the corner, but I think that it is clear that uh, what are basically the parameters, but we need uh, the right Israeli government, the right leadership on, on the Palestinian side and the right American administration, which we have now, but uh, I think that it's premature to reopen, uh, to relaunch negotiations now. I'm going to turn to a question from Lisa Eisen. It seems that the influence of women in Israeli politics is waning rather than growing, with Mirav Michali being a notable exception in, the, in leading labor. Most of the faces in, recent, in the recent election are male. How do you envision changing this dynamic in a society that is turning further to the right and seemingly less open to diversity and leadership and equal rights and representation? Well, one of the problems that we have uh parties in Israel, the ultra-Orthodox parties, that you would not find any uh, woman participating in elections or being part of the list uh, to the parliament. Um, and there's, there's a need to encourage uh, more and more uh, women to participate in the political process. Uh, in the past, we had some ideas how um, to encourage parties even with uh, giving more uh, uh, money to um, parties that have in their list more and more uh, women. I think that, I hope anyway, that in, in it's clear now that uh, especially after and during COVID that uh, women as leaders uh, gave better answers uh, to their own people or knew how to get the right decisions in dealing or meeting the challenge of COVID. So I hope, and I hope this is the beginning of a change. It looks like people understand it. And in most of the parties, you don't have a, a woman as a leader, but as number two, which is more than we had in the past. Uh, but it's mostly about, uh, you know, educating society and uh, educating also uh, young uh, uh, women that it's possible. 
Minister Lim, we have a question from uh, Todd Richman, and he is our board co-chair. And uh, he says, thank you for zooming in for all you have done for Israel and for the U.S.-Israel relationship. I would like to know when you're going to get back into elected politics so we can see you as a future prime minister. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I quit politics two years ago um, because unfortunately what I believed in, uh, peace and democracy, uh, didn't get enough support. Uh, and each and every time uh, when I'm being asked to rejoin politics, the question that I'm asking myself is whether there's a possibility here to make the change. Because for me, politics is not just, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, just to be there. I don't believe in just being there. So the real question is whether I can make the change. And for now, it looks, it looked anyway, during this campaign, unlikely. But who knows? OK. All right, I'm going to go to a question from uh, Judy Rossman. And, and uh, she asks, I've heard that Palestinians in the Arab world is framing the debate over Palestinian control of the land as rights-based, as a rights-based okay, conversation. I, I cannot hear you. Can you read oh, this? I'm sorry, sure, I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask it again. I'll get, move a little bit closer. I've heard that the Palestinians in the Arab world are framing the debate over Palestinian control of the land as, rights, as a rights-based conversation, which totally sidesteps and ignores the idea of two states. How do we keep the idea of a two-state solution alive and prevent others from making the conversation only about rights? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that... Uh... The question uh, is the question about shifting from two states for two peoples into something like one state with equal rights. I, I think it's about how do we keep uh, the two state solution alive. Um, on both sides, there's a shift. Uh, words that were not legitimate in the past, like annexation, uh, became legitimate. And I hear more and more on the Palestinian side saying, okay, so let's give. Uh, let's get equal rights. And the meaning is, and this is uh, my concern, is that we are in a kind of a slip, slippery slope toward one state without noticing, without speaking about it. Because this is happening if we will not decide to keep the door open and to make some steps toward two states for two peoples. So the notion on the Israeli side is that this can continue forever and uh, then we will find ourselves one day with Palestinians saying, okay, if we don't have a state, so we want uh, voting rights. And from my perspective, the choice, we shouldn't have the choice between being uh, a Jewish state or a democracy. We need to have both these values of the state of Israel as a Jewish democratic state living in harmony and not in contradiction. And on the Palestinian side, I think that, in fact, the idea that the Palestinian Authority exists gives also uh, an answer to Israelis when they are being asked what about rights of the Palestinians, they say they have their own Palestinian Authority, so it's not our responsibility anymore. Um, so I don't know what would happen on the Palestinian side, but I'm afraid that without real discussion, and we are after the fourth round of elections in Israel, this was not on the table, it's not on the agenda. And I'm not sure that it's on the agenda also on the Palestinian side. And therefore it's very, the role of the US and the new administration is of utmost importance because, and this is something that I can say about Israel and the Palestinian side, the relations with the US are of, um, strategic nature to Israel and also for the Palestinians. Uh, after the Trump administration, after cutting the budget and uh, closing the uh, office in Washington and the consulate in Jerusalem, they want to have better relations with, with the American administration. And the, when the message coming from the US is, hey, we are moving back to two states for two peoples, this, can, this is very important. Even though I believe that uh, peace with the Palestinians uh, is not a favor to an American administration, but an Israeli need. But uh, it would help as well. 
Okay, we have, I'm gonna to go to a question from Shirley Rosenhaus and, and Shirley asks, as an Israeli woman living in California, which program do you recommend me to join in order to support and be involved with the Israeli-American democratic bond and connections? If it's okay, I'm gonna take the first part of it and, and just give a slight plug. Shirley, I hope you'll consider getting involved with DMFI. We have a lot of grassroots activism opportunities. Our sister organization, DMFI PAC, has, has been involved in uh, helping uh, helping the candidacies for more than uh, 83 uh, uh, pro-Israel Democrats at least were uh, successful with uh, that number. So I hope you'll, you'll consider contacting us. You can find out how to reach me or anyone uh, on the staff uh, pretty easily. You can also message me and I'll, I'll send you over my email. And um, Minister Livni, I wanted to allow you to answer that. And the second part of Shirley's question is also about your future uh, political ambitions in Israel, and would you consider running for president? <laughs> it, uh, I, I would say something uh, personally. I was asked uh, why did I decide to join politics, and I uh, shared with you that this was a one-day decision. Uh, when I felt that I need to quit politics because I didn't want to split votes and uh, uh, because I felt that I cannot be uh, uh, influential enough in politics. This is what I did. So I'm not thinking now about whether I will come back to politics in the future. I'm outside of politics now. If I can contribute to my country, that's fine. And no, I'm not part of because uh, the next elections for president is in two uh, months within the parliament. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a candidate in this uh, round of elections to presidency. Okay. But thank you for asking. I mean, I take it as a compliment. Thank you. Well, we've had a lot of people ask ask a similar question, as you see. Mr. Livni, can you talk to us about some of your your role models, either in Israel or really around the world? I'll say something uh, about uh, uh, women in office, because frankly, and uh, I speak openly, when I joined politics, you asked me, why did I join politics? I was speaking about the conflict and women in power and was not part of my agenda, okay? I said, okay, if you would have asked me 10 years ago about is there a different way of, uh, of leadership, uh, met, uh, uh, between men and women, I'd say, no way, we are human beings and all this stuff that uh, and, uh, without noticing. But after being in office, and after being uh, like uh, um, women in leadership, uh, I, it, it could be uh, um, Angela Merkel and Condi Rice and Hillary Clinton. And altogether, I discovered that we are doing things different. It's less about our ego. It is more about an inner compass that leads us. It's about knowing what's right and wrong without listening what's good for me in politics, but what serves the interest of my country and my people. So I don't have one uh, role model in, in life, but I feel after uh, being in office that uh, having, uh, that we have um, a shared understanding in a compass way of looking at things that uh, I find, I found, uh, in, in while working with, with women, uh, not lots of them uh, in, in all these uh, important places in the world, but this is what I found. Not specifically, not by names, but it's something that also encouraged me. Thank you, Minister Livni. I'm gonna uh, ask you one more question and then I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Mark Melman to close us out. I hope that's all right. Are there conversations about recommending to Rivlin an outside figure for prime minister? Did Gavi Ashkenazi sit out the election for that reason? No, you don't ask me to relate to specific uh, politicians in Israel. I would not. Okay. 
I, uh, Frank, I, I hope you understand. I decided to quit politics. I'm not speaking about uh, politics in Israel, not in Hebrew, not in English. I'm not a commentator on politics. I'm trying to, uh, to do to the outside of politics and not, you know, to, um, to explain or to be a commentator on, on Israeli politics. So, and Mark knows better than me to do it. <laughs> Maybe that's why, yes. <laughs> okay, I see Mark has popped up. I'm gonna, uh, well, thank you, Minister Livni. We are so grateful for your time. We know there's and, many and, demands and on your time. Thank you, if I may say a few words about the importance of what you are doing, because for many years, uh, the idea is that the relations between Israel and, and, and the United States is, is bipartisan. And I worked with different administrations, Republican and, and Democrats. And I, I know how it felt in the last few years when the feeling was that on one side you have uh, Trump administration and Netanyahu in Israel and some of uh, uh, Democrats and the Jewish communities feel alienated to, 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 to Israel. And uh, um, I think that it's now very important to re-engage and to find a common denominator and to understand uh, what the values that Israel represent and we share these values. And um, I mean, thank you. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Libney. And thank you so much for being with us. This has been an amazing um, afternoon for me. Two incredibly inspirational figures, Senator Shaheen, Minister Libney, uh, both of whom occupy huge roles in my pantheon of uh, world political leaders. So again, we're so grateful for your participation. We're so grateful for your kind words about our work. And we are so grateful for the many contributions that you've made to Israel, to peace, to the US-Israel relationship. And we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, and with Senator Shaheen uh, to make sure that we not only have peace, but we also have more women uh, in leading political roles in this country and in Israel. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, again, we hope you'll uh, follow us on social media if you're not yet. And we look forward to seeing you on future events. Thank you very much.